such a beautiful woman, yet she suffered such brutal abuse. A man pulled out a high-powered iron, plugged it in, and then forcefully pushed Sarah into the bathtub. <laughs> Paul resorted to such drastic measures because Sarah's father had hidden a recording. This incriminating recording, once exposed, would inevitably lead to President Caroline's downfall, but Sarah truly had no idea what they were after, and her father hadn't given her anything before he died. While in the water, Sarah suddenly remembers picking up an unfamiliar key next to her father's body, perhaps the very place where he had the recording, but Sarah would never reveal this because, even if she did, she would be silenced by murder. Seeing no results from his interrogation, Paul decided to drown Sarah in the bathtub, just as Paul was about to saw her body into pieces. A knock from the hotel owner sounded outside due to complaints from neighbors about the noise. While they talked, Sarah managed to bite open the bathtub's valve. By the time Paul returned to the room, the bathtub was empty, a mere shadow of its former self. <laughs> Seizing the moment, Sarah quickly grabbed the key from the table and escaped through the window. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bill called to inquire about the outcome. Paul, not knowing how to explain, lied that Sarah was already dead, but Bill wasn't fooled and demanded a photo of the disposed body. Seeing his lie exposed, Paul knew the company wouldn't let him off easily, so, he hurriedly made a call to Caroline, pleading for mercy, but Caroline, now president, would certainly not associate with someone like him. When Paul tried to contact his former colleagues, he discovered he had been erased from the system, as if he had never existed in this world at all. Clearly, it wouldn't be long before he would disappear from this world entirely. On the other side, another power was also searching for the whereabouts of the recording. Aldo wanted to bring down Caroline and the company and clear his son Lincoln's name, so he had to find Sarah and get the recording first. Knowing the special relationship between Michael and Sarah, Aldo persuaded Lincoln to find Michael. After leaving LJ with a secretary, they rushed to meet Michael, as agreed by the two brothers, unexpectedly. Sucre also showed up. After Mary Cruz ran away from her wedding to avoid Hector's harassment, she went to Mexico alone to clear her mind. Meanwhile, Michael was also heading to Mexico. So Sucre followed him all the way here to meet up with Michael. Michael had the meet here because he had made a detailed escape plan before going to jail. He had the coordinates tattooed on his body. 200 kilometers from here was a smuggler who, for a price, could get them on a plane to Mexico. Along the way, Aldo tried hard to persuade Michael not to flee the country, claiming that getting the recording would set them free, but Michael had seen Sarah just yesterday and heard nothing about a recording. Moreover, Michael knew too well the government's darkness. Having the recording might not necessarily bring down the president. While the two sides were at a standstill, a familiar figure appeared on a distant hill. After being released, Mahone continued to analyze the tattoos and, breaking his head over it, finally realized that the numbers looked more like coordinates. So. He hurriedly drove to the location. Go! They narrowly escape, but unexpectedly, Aldo was shot in the stomach during his escape and is seriously injured. The two could only give their father a simple burial, though Aldo hadn't raised them for over 30 years. He had done what he did to avoid involving his family. From that moment on, Michael resolved to stay and avenge his father. The three drove to the smuggling point. After hugging Sucre goodbye, they watched him board the plane. Panama would have been good. Are you ready for this? I've been waiting years. Good to hear it. Because today is the day we start running. But on the brothers' way back, a fighter jet flew over them, which must have been there to intercept the stowaway plane. Just as Michael was worrying about Sucre, Mahone's car caught up again, and the fighter jet intercepting them was there because he had alerted the authorities. They hurriedly fled in their car, but hadn't anticipated that their fuel wouldn't last as long as Mahone's. From day to night, Mahone finally succeeded in capturing the two brothers, but just as Mahone was about to shoot the two brothers, the Border Patrol arrived in time. United States Border Patrol, drop your weapon! Reluctantly, Mahone had no choice but to lower his gun, albeit begrudgingly. In the women's restroom, Sarah lit a match to sterilize the sewing needle in her hand. She took a deep breath, 
preparing to stitch a long tear on her arm, but despite several attempts, she couldn't muster the courage to start. Sarah slapped the restroom door hard, and finally, with gritted teeth and without anesthesia, she stitched through her flesh, needle by needle, to avoid detection. Sarah endured the immense pain without making a sound. She dared not go to the hospital because she was harboring a shocking secret, which, if revealed, would inevitably bring down the current President Caroline and was the direct cause of her being hunted. In this world, the only person Sarah could trust was her beloved Michael, but despite repeatedly dialing Michael's number, no one answered. It wasn't until she saw the news of the Michael brothers' arrest on TV that Sarah was completely stunned. This meant that she no longer had anyone in the world she could trust. Sarah returned to the hotel and started simulating cutting off her long hair with a blade. To avoid recognition, she had to painfully cut off her beloved long hair. Then she discarded her phone, bank cards, and ID, and began a life on the run. On the other side, the news of Michael and Lincoln's capture made the headlines, and the investigative team was overjoyed. But Mahone couldn't feel happy because if Michael and Lincoln were brought back to Washington, the company's dirty deeds would inevitably be exposed. Bill also called, ordering Mahone to kill them en route at any cost. That afternoon, the Michael brothers' transport process was initiated, with a group of fully armed police looking impenetrable. Meanwhile, Bill had made arrangements on his end. They would create an opportunity for Mahone, who just needed to shoot at the escaping brothers in the chaos. Then, a call was made to Paul, ostensibly asking him to assist Mahone in the killing. Secretly, Bill instructed Mahone to ensure that, amid the chaos, a stray bullet would take out Paul as well. The vehicle transporting them quickly arrived at a tunnel, where, as expected, a large truck broke down and blocked the way. All the police rushed forward to help. This series of actions thoroughly confused Michael. They couldn't possibly be thinking of lifting the truck away, could they? What puzzled him even more was that the guards watching over them were also called over to help. As the police left, the keys to the handcuffs just happened to fall on the seat, and the door to the opposite culvert was also open. Come on. All right, let's see if we get the cuffs off. Where do we go? It seemed too coincidental, so much so that even a fool could see this was a blatant attempt to let them escape. However, the brothers were caught in a dilemma. If they didn't run, Lincoln would return to prison to face the death penalty, and Michael would spend the rest of his life in prison. Running would mean giving Mahone permission to shoot to kill. But still, there was that sliver of hope. After weighing their options, the brothers decided to take a desperate chance. Here we go. Here we go. Copy that. Right, we're on. Heads up. Full traffic. Lincoln was the first to climb over the railing, with Michael following closely behind. In a moment of life and death, the two successfully escaped into the culvert, but they didn't know it was a dead end. With Mahone relentlessly pursuing them and Paul blocking the exit, the brothers realized they were trapped. However, at the critical moment when Mahone was about to shoot, Paul acted first, and it was a bewildered Mahone who fell. President Reynolds ruined your life. She ruined my life. You want to take the bitch down? You just found your inside man, but it's got to be right now. Let's go! Now! It turned out Paul was well aware of his situation. Now, having been expelled from the system, his next step would be to vanish without a trace. It was better to join forces with Michael and his brother, hoping for a slim chance of survival. With Paul's status as an intelligence agency operative, the three of them easily made their way to a secluded cabin in Montana. There, they found the President Caroline's supposedly dead brother, Terence, being held. If Terence were to appear in public, Caroline and the company would never have a chance to recover. He looked pretty good for a dead man. Get in the car! Wait, 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 wait. Who's there? It's Kelly. Where are you taking Get in the car! Do not let him escape. Kill Stedman. Kill them all now. To escape police capture, Teabag bit off his hand that had just been stitched up a few days ago, having escaped. Teabag arrived at a bar and started celebrating while looking at his wanted photo on TV. But just as Teabag turned around, he saw something of interest a very realistic looking prosthetic hand. Teabag immediately approached to ask a veteran where he got his arm attached, indicating he was willing to pay any price. However, the destitute and cynical soldier, having lost an arm himself, wondered why Teabag was so wealthy. Thus, the veteran flatly refused Teabag, but the veteran didn't know how ruthless the man before him could be. After leaving the bar, 
The hand had already become Teabag's. Teabag squatted in front of the post office, and then he was going to do something that will completely change your mind. But in the end, you would be deeply moved by his twisted actions. After waiting for a female employee to leave work, Teabag approached her. During their meal, Teabag even tenderly wiped a grain of rice from her mouth. One had to admire Teabag's flirting skills. In just a few minutes, he had Denise beaming with joy. Upon learning that Denise had just gotten divorced, Teabag boldly confessed. And by the end of the meal, Denise was easily won over. Teabag asked Denise to help look up a relative's address. Blinded by love, Denise didn't have the slightest doubt and helped Teabag look up a cousin named Susan. But the moment Denise handed the printed information to Teabag, her face instantly froze. Oh dear God. I really wish you hadn't seen that. By the time Teabag left the post office, Denise was already a dead body lying on the ground. Not long after, Teabag arrived at Susan's doorstep, nervously fixing his hair. Then, Teabag took a deep breath and knocked on Susan's door. Hello, Mrs. Hollander. They say a good woman is hard to find. Well, if that's true, you must be very, very, very good. Fear was written all over Susan's face. She had once deeply loved this man and even thought about marrying him, until she discovered that this man was a fugitive wanted for the rape and murder of six students. She took the opportunity to report Teabag and send him to prison. Then, she moved to this place where no acquaintances knew her to live. But Teabag was also deeply in love with her, the only one who made him want to put aside his past and start anew. Teabag said he had forgiven her, and he only wanted to reintegrate into her family to be a good father and a good husband. During their conversation, Susan's two children came home from school. They were unusually happy about their mother's long unseen boyfriend's visit. Clearly, Susan had not mentioned anything about Teabag to them. When Gracie asked Teabag how he lost his arm, Teabag had no choice but to lie that it was an accident at work, but he received a million dollars in compensation for each finger. Taking advantage of this moment, Susan tried to retrieve the handgun from the drawer, but Teabag quickly got up and grabbed her. Teabag stated that the five million dollars would be spent on the three of them, fearing for her children's safety. Susan had to pretend to be happy. In the afternoon, Teabag pulled Susan to watch TV with the children, and he was genuinely happy at that moment. However, Susan was uncomfortable. She intentionally spilled tea to try and retrieve the handgun from the drawer, but she didn't know the gun had already been taken by Teabag. We did put the past where it belonged. Not. Do not lie to me, woman. I have to turn cold me to the authorities. And everything we had after breaking my heart into so many pieces that I will never give And the more you can at least do me the favors to not stand there and lie to my face. Mom? Zack sensed his mother's panic he hurriedly copied the ball bag and slammed it at Teabag. But how could the strength of Susan and her two children possibly match Teabag's? In a moment, they were trapped in the house again. After this incident, Teabag nailed all the doors and windows shut with wooden boards. However, neighbors kept coming over to look for Susan. Knowing this couldn't go on without being discovered, Teabag decided to take them back to his old home, which he remembered. The place had been uninhabited for many years and had fallen into disrepair. Teabag pushed open the door, a place he never wanted to enter again unless absolutely necessary. He moved a cabinet and pulled out a thick dictionary from a small hole behind it. Flipping through the yellowed pages, memories of the past slowly emerged in his mind. Teabag was born from the incestuous relationship between his father and his mentally disabled sister. His father was a drunkard who hung out with bad company and would have Teabag perform spelling words for entertainment. Whenever his friends left, his father violated Teabag like an animal. Since then, Teabag had a deep hatred for his family's blood. Until he met Susan, it was only when he met Susan that he felt like he had a new lease on life. He asked Susan to rebuild his family with him. But how could Susan agree with a man who was wanted for the rape and murder of six students? Teabag finally told her the truth. The six students were actually direct relatives of the Teabag family. He wanted to cut off this dirty and evil bloodline, so he wouldn't want children. He intended to let the bloodline end with his generation. Teabag once again pleaded with Susan to accept him and live together. But from the fear in Susan's eyes, Teabag already knew the answer. I can't. He locked up the mother and her two children, then sat silently in the yard by himself, staring at the axe on the tree stump as his tongue involuntarily began to move again. Not long after, 
The basement door was reopened, and the mother and her two children were completely terrified. However, what appeared in front of them were two policemen. The police said they rushed over after receiving an anonymous tip, but in such a remote place, it was impossible for anyone to know. And several kilometers away on the road, Teabag dropped the phone, sobbing uncontrollably. This was the first time in his life he felt such loss, because the hope that had always sustained him from then on was shattered. Perhaps he could never have an ordinary family for the rest of his life. Michael's reason for escaping from prison was to save his brother Lincoln, who was framed and sentenced to death. The charge was the accusation of murdering the President Caroline's brother, Terence. After two months of relentless effort, the brothers finally managed to escape from prison and capture Terence, who was faking his death. Once Terence appeared in public, it was expected that Lincoln's wrongful case would collapse on its own. Caroline and the company behind her would also have no chance of turning things around. However, what they hadn't anticipated was that although the person in front of them was indeed Terence, his teeth had already been pulled out by the company, and his fingerprints had been erased. Terence had not only undergone plastic surgery but even the DNA in his file had been replaced and tampered with. So, even if Terence showed his face, no one would recognize who he was. Just as the situation became deadlocked again, Terence was mocking Paul, the intelligence agency operative who had just switched sides. You're just a lowly lapdog. Don't think I don't know you're slaving away for my sister Caroline because you're hopelessly in love with her. You even proposed to her. But with your background, how could my sister ever look at you? After saying this, Terence covered his false teeth and laughed loudly, completely infuriating Lincoln. We all suffered because of you. Some died. Some went to prison. And you still have the nerve to laugh? You kill him? He's just a John Doe. Just put your gun down. When he puts his down, Link, we're so close. What's well, worth it? Killing those people. Ruining my so life. You'll get a handle on Shut your up. brother. You're not helping. You're not helping, Link. You don't want to do this. Trust me. With Michael's persuasion, Lincoln finally managed to suppress his rage and put down the gun. But this standoff wasn't a solution. Ignoring Paul's objections, Michael picked up the phone and called the local most famous TV station. This is Michael Schofield. I'm at the Cutback Motel Room 11. And I want to turn myself in. Such explosive news was, of course, something the TV station wouldn't miss. However, Terence became extremely agitated upon knowing that Michael intended to expose him. Suddenly, Terence snatched the gun from Lincoln's waist, wanting them to let him go. Terence, we can't let you do that, Terence. Terence, all we need is your mouth. I will shoot out both your knees right now. I never liked you, Paul. I won't hesitate to take your life. Listen to me. Just listen. Terrence, for once in your life, do the right thing. All right? But not wanting to ruin his sister's future and fearing imprisonment, after much hesitation, he chose suicide. Sorry. Terrence! The three of them wanted to die. It's all over now. The police and the TV station had already arrived outside, but the body inside could not prove to be Terrence. Moreover, the brothers were still fugitives. This time, they were completely stuck in a dead end. Fortunately, Paul thought of a solution. He first showed his agent ID, then pretended to have arrived first to capture the two men. Once they came out, they took advantage of the situation to take a cameraman hostage and quickly drove away. After shaking off the police pursuit, the three of them arrived at an empty warehouse. After some discussion, they decided to create a sensational news story using the cameraman. Mahone had already recovered and returned to work, as the shot hadn't hit a vital part. And the news was currently broadcasting Michael and his brother's appeal video. Penitentiary because I was sentenced to death for a crime I did not commit. I did not murder Terrence Stedman. He committed suicide last night in the Cutback Motel, 30 miles outside from his home in Blackfoot, Montana. He killed himself out of fear. They've stolen billions of dollars and murdered dozens of innocent people. And yet they plaster our faces on the news and tell you to be afraid. They are a group of multinationals, corporate interests. Together they're known as the company. They are working with the highest levels of government, including the President of the United States. The next part was Michael expressing his apologies to Sarah, but the speech was interspersed with a code, hoping Sarah would see it and meet up with them. However, Mahone, being extremely intelligent, knew that not many people would believe the words of two fugitives. 
Moreover, there was no substantial evidence to pose a threat to the president and the company. So, the words Michael said to Sarah afterward were the most crucial. Immediately, Mahone printed out this speech and rushed to Fox River State Penitentiary to ask Sarah's former colleagues for clarification, and this was seen by Bellick, who had recently been imprisoned and brutally tormented. Speaking of Bellick, it's necessary to mention his regrettable past. Initially, Sarah's job here was actually thanks to Bellick's recommendation. Bellick, a middle-aged single man living with his mother, had always wanted to find a partner. He had intended to introduce Sarah to work here, and then slowly develop a relationship with her. But Sarah had no interest in him at all. For Bellick, he knew everything about what Sarah liked, what books she read. Upon seeing this speech, he realized that a few words were from a book Sarah liked very much. Mahone bought and reviewed the book, indeed finding a hidden message. At this time, Bill called to say that they had found traces of Haywire, a member of the escape team, but Mahone had no intention of focusing on such minor characters, so he went back to the prison to recruit Bellick to assist him. As long as Bellick agreed to be his dog, he could gain his freedom. I need a junkyard dog who's willing to do the ugly things it takes to bring a con to justice. Are you my dog, Brad? Damn hell yeah, I am. The freed Bellic arrived at the scene and finally cornered Haywire on a high platform. He immediately called Mahone. Mahone's purpose was clear. Anyone who had contact with the brothers had to die but not too obviously. So, after a thorough lecture from Mahone that this world was hell and jumping down would take one to heaven, Haywire was influenced by Mahone to finally jump from the platform. The next day, Michael and Sarah finally met at the train station, but with time pressing, there was no chance to talk about love. The urgent matter was to figure out the real purpose of the key. They looked at each other, clueless. Hi Sarah, we've got someone working with us now. So, Michael introduced their new partner to Sarah. It was also at this time that Michael finally learned that Sarah had been severely abused by Paul. For the first time, Michael felt the urge to kill someone, but without Paul, their chances of taking down Caroline were almost impossible. Regaining his composure, Michael finally let go of his anger. Paul said the key belonged to a private club in Chicago. The four of them hurriedly set off. Paul, using his agent identity again, boarded the train and isolated a carriage for themselves. Midway, Paul secretly made a call to Caroline. Even then, Paul was hesitating whether to hand over Michael and his brother to Caroline or return to Caroline's side to obediently be her lapdog, but Caroline kept asking where they were, urging him to bring the people to her, never mentioning what would happen to them afterward. Although the agent's phone was equipped with anti-location tracking, Paul was unaware that Bill was arranging for someone to pinpoint his location through the sound of his voice. Before long, the train suddenly slowed down, and looking outside, they discovered that the train had been intercepted. This time, they might truly be trapped with no escape. 